Can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> if you can't hear me, put up your hand. No. Um, you need to be allowed a microphone. Okay. I think my microphone might be caught in the folds of my dress. So, um, let's see what I can do about that. How's that? Yeah. Good? Okay. So, yeah, we've got a bit of a double header for you here. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the fort, about its um, history, political context. I'm going to put it in the context of um, eroding sites from all over Scotland. And then I'm going to hand over to Fiona and Willie from the Friends of the Fort, I might, who will tell you about the actual project work we've undertaken. So, um, I'm from Scape. That's uh, Scottish Coastal Archaeology and the Problem of Erosion. And we work on eroding coastal sites around Scotland with a particular focus on coastal erosion and public involvement is at the heart of everything that we do. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. So we do work all over Scotland. At the moment we're working on a project that has a data set of 12,000 sites uh, from 40% of the Scottish coast, the areas that um, have been surveyed are the ones you can see um, with dots on, on that map. About 1,000 of those are high priority sites for us, which are both important and eroding. And our fort is, is one of the real high priority sites that, that we're dealing with. <coughs> so we're currently working on the Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk project, which is all about um, working with these high priority sites. The first part of the project, Shore Update, is all about updating the records of these 12,000 sites, with a particular focus on the 1,000 high priority ones. The second part is Shore Dig, where we work with members of the community, like Fiona and Willie, to do pr project work at some of these high priority sites. And I, my fort, is one of our Shore Dig projects. So I'm just going to take in a quick gallop around Scotland to uh, show you some of the um, other eroding sites and put I, my fort in the overall Scottish context. So we're starting with um, an industrial site at St Mon and St Fife. Moving up to Angus, we've got more industrial sites. This is a, a, a lime kiln at Bodden Point. We've got the Second World War Defensive Archaeology in Angus. Carrying on up the east coast to Brora in East Sutherland, we've got um, an, another industrial site, a salt pans eroding out the um, sand dune there. Then up to Orkney, where the, a, a lot of the coastal archaeology is a bit different. We're looking at settlement remains there, often on the beach, which just shows the, the degree of sea level change there's been there. These people weren't actually living on the beach. So this is a, a broch. Uh, a, some more industrial archaeology here. This is a, a kelp burning pit, which has been half, half sectioned by the sea. Um, structures, which have been exposed in the coast edge in Sandy and Orkney, as well as a couple of settlement mounds where we've got stone buildings and deep midden deposits, which again have been completely half sectioned by the sea. In this one, you can see there's several phases of stone building have been revealed there. Um, then up to Shetland, this is a brock, which was completely unknown. Well, we think it's a brock, we're not entirely sure yet. Uh, but it was uh, completely unknown until it was revealed by the storms in winter 2012. So this is a, quite a new discovery. Then moving across the Western Isles, we've got Burnt Mounds and Lewis, which was identified in the course of this project. That one is right next door to a metalworking site in the same dune system. Then, I don't know if you've um, heard recently, just the past week, about a Bronze Age or possibly Iron Age basket that was uh, discovered in the beach at North Uist at Ballyshire. That's directly in front of this wheelhouse. What we have here is a wheelhouse eroding out of the dunes on, on Ballyshire beach, beach, North Uist. And then to bring us back round to Ima, back close to home, the fort here is eroding as well. The erosion here is due largely to the unstable composition, the geology of the promontory on which the fort's been built. So you can see it is suffering from quite serious erosion there. So we're very lucky at Scape. We're working with the UK Civil Air Patrol, who um, are a group of pilots who go out and fly and uh, take wonderful aerial photos of archaeological sites for us, which is, is great. And uh, they've taken the most spectacular series of uh, aerial photos of the fort for us. So just to give you a very quick overview, there are two uh, phases of earthwork defences at the fort. It's one phase and that's the other one. Now, I've already talked about the erosion. The other main challenge that I my fort faces as a site is uh, lack of interpretation, just because these, uh, these earthwork defences, they look great from the air, which is why I've shown you these photos, but they're actually really hard to make sense of on the ground. So that's one of the main, main problems the site's faced, is that it's been 
underappreciated for most of its history. So why is that? Why do we have this amazing site which is actually extremely important but is really underappreciated? Well, it's all to do with the development of gunpowder. Um, in the um, 15th, 16th century, gunpowder uh, was developed, cannons were being used in, in warfare for the first time, and that really necessitated a change in defensive building technology. Castles with stone walls were hopeless against these things. They'd just fire cannonballs at the stone walls, they'd shatter, they'd fall down, you'd lost your castle. So the response to that new threat was to build these huge earthwork embankments and bastions which could just absorb the impact of the cannonball, became much, much harder to take a site that was defended by these earthwork ramparts with, with gunpowder and cannonballs. So just to give you a few examples of a few uh, well-known sites that uh, use this technology, we've got Nicosia and Cyprus. And probably the best known example from Britain is, of course, uh, Beth upon Tweed, which still survives really well. So that's just to give you a quick idea of um, a nice, as uh, was it Matt was saying earlier about nice earthwork surveys and hashers? That's what the site looks like. And again, here we are. That's what we're looking at here. That's bastions and earthworks just like we've seen at Nicosia and at uh, Beth on Tweed. That's just a reconstruction to give you an idea of what it would have looked like uh, based on some work that was done before the 1980s. <coughs> Now, I'm actually really glad I have to say that we've been moved forward to before the, the uh, coffee break because it actually means that I can give our colleagues from the computer science department at the University of St Andrews a quick plug because um, they have actually put together a spectacular 3D computer reconstruction and interactive model of IMI 40 in the 16th century. So this is the old technology from the 1980s, but over the coffee break you can go and have a look with the van up to date 21st century um, model and reconstruction of a fort that our colleagues have put together. So, why was the fort built in the first place? Well, it's all because of this lady here. Now, we've already had uh, James V mentioned, and again, this site comes, comes back to him. He died in 1542, and at that point, his daughter Mary was just 10 days old. He died without ha having ever seen her, and with 10 day old infant Mary was Queen of Scotland. Um, so, her mother was Mary of Guise, a, a French widow, and Henry VIII, who was the King of England at that time, saw this opportunity for him to um, really move in on Scotland by marrying the infant Queen Mary to his son Edward, who then went on to be Edward VI. Um, however, Mary's regent, Earl of Arran, wasn't too keen on that, so he, he refused, and Henry, despite having been married, what, six times, doesn't really seem to have understood the way to win a woman's heart because he then embarked on the campaign of the rough wooing, which unsurprisingly wasn't really very successful. Um, in 1547, Henry VIII died and Edward VI ascended the throne. His, Somerset, his um, regent was the Duke of Somerset and he um, had a sort of different tactic to Henry. Rather than the um, sort of raiding campaign of the rough wooing, he had a, a different policy and one of the first things he did was look at establishing forts as bases in Scotland to use as a, as a base for a raiding party. So I Micrometry was chosen for one of these uh, staging posts and as a base for the area. Uh, so in September 1547, um, the English started to construct the fort and in December of that year, they had a decisive victory over the Scots at the Battle of Pinkie. Um, in the following year, August 1548, Mary was betrothed to the French Dauphin, Francis, and that really strengthened the ties between Scotland and France, and of course marked the failure of the, of the rough wooing, which probably won't take any of us by, by surprise. Uh, then finally in 1550, as part of the Treaty of Berlin between France and England, one of the conditions was that the English had to abandon Imouth Fort. So the, fort, the, the English phase of the fort was then demolished and abandoned. <coughs> so that's what we're looking at here. These are the English line of defence. We've got the earthwork bank and the bastion, which is known as the, as the King's Mount. So this actually, for its time, like I say, it doesn't look like much in the promontory, but for its time, it was a really sophisticated system of fortification. It was probably influenced by the English engineers who'd been fighting in northern France, around Berlin, who'd seen this sort of technology there. 
They'd also been working with engineers, with, with Italian engineers who, who knew this technology well. And this is a very good case, actually, to be the first trapped Italian fortification in Britain. So it really is quite important. We've got a nice plan as well from uh, Belvoir Castle of the fortifications as they were in 1549. Um, so the next stage is the, the French fort, which is really all due to, again, Mary and her mother, Mary of Guise. So Mary of Guise became her daughter's regent in the mid-1550s, um, and with, with Mary betrothed to the um, heir to the French throne, the ties between England, uh, between Scotland and France were becoming really, really close. That provoked a lot of internal tension. A lot of the Scottish lords weren't very happy about that. There was growing threat of Protestantism that was on the rise in Scotland. And this is against the backdrop to the siege of St Andrew's Castle, the murder of Cardinal Beaton and so on. Um, so there was also increasing aggression between France and the English-Spanish alliance. So against that backdrop, the French took the decision to reoccupy Armouth Fort. So um, they started rebuilding the fortifications. They reused the English line and they built their own defensive line. Um, <coughs> The following year, um, that was in 1557, they reoccupied the fort. The following year, it was the first came to the throne, and she was deeply paranoid by Eyemouth. She was really unhappy with this major French stronghold on her borders. So the defences at Berwick upon Tweed were remodelled as a direct response to the threat of Eyemouth. Then uh, the following year, 1559, as part of the Treaty of Cato Cambresi between England and France, one of the conditions was that the French had to abandon the fort. The English did remain insecure about it, but um, that was the end of it. Within a couple of years, the fort had been completely abandoned. So what the French actually did was they reoccupied, they refortified the, the English line, and they built their own defensive line further out. This was actually a, an improvement on the English fortifications, because it, um, it not only reused them and reused the King's Mount as a gun mount, it also include, included that troublesome little peninsula there, which had been a threat to the, the English fort. They had their, their new line, which actually had two, two bastions with flankers. So these two, these two bastions could actually protect each other, which was far more effective than having the single central one on the English line. We also have a lovely spy plan, which is very sweet, but uh, not particularly accurate. As I have heard this described as the 16th century equivalent of a scribble on the back of a fag packet. <laughs> So um, in terms of uh, actually getting a handle on what it would have looked like, I'd suggest again going to have a look at the um, computer reconstruction. Uh, there was also um, a season of excavation in the, 18, in the 1980s uh, by the National Museum of Scotland. Their trenches were targeting both the fortifications and the uh, buildings in the interior. So that's given us a lot of information about what was, what was in there. So, I just want to finish off by saying that it's really it's thanks to Eyemouth that um, the walls at Berwick were built. Um, the defences here at Berwick are so well known, but they were directly because of the threat of Eyemouth. And it seems really unfair to me, actually, that Berwick is so well known and so, so understood, whereas Eyemouth is almost completely forgotten about. So now I've painted you this sort of slightly pessimistic picture of the challenges the fort's facing, the erosion and the lack of, of, of understanding. I'm going to hand you over now to Fiona and Willie, who are going to tell us all about the great work they've done to um, celebrate the fort and promote it and put it back on the map and bring it back into the 21st century. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm just going to very quickly rush through this because I usually go on endlessly and bore everyone to tears. This is actually probably, it should be called the saga of the wandering sign <laughs> because every time I walked up there with the dog, the sign moved and eventually I thought, well, there must be some importance with this. So I phoned SBC and spoke with a, a gentleman called Chris Bowles. <laughs> and um, as an aside to this, we gave this presentation at Creef last weekend, and I advertently said that Chris was scrumptious 
to the whole week ahead, they were known as Scrumptious Chris. <laughs> but we, we, I, I had a meeting with him, and he walked me over the site, and I was so absolutely excited and, and thrilled that we had this on the headland at I mouth and knew nothing about it. So I, at the time, um, I spoke with the community council, and we decided, well, to get it working properly, we have to have some kind of access. So together with the local community and with various people around, and um, we thought, well, we really and truly have to make this more access available. And then Scape, who, who we'd been in touch with, could come down and see it as we hoped it might look eventually. So this was my dream. <laughs> and we had um, local, local community councillor, the local farmer, he gave us his worker called Big Sandy, and he was tremendous. And we cut it and we actually lifted 200 bags of grass that day. It was fantastic. And what happened after that was that everybody, we were also involved, General Mills, who perhaps some people, um, it's, they, they're based in Berwick, and they are our main supporter, and they came along with their team. And Willie's going to jump in here and tell me, tell you all about that. And I've gone off with him. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Hello, my name is Willie Crombie and I'm, uh, I work at General Mills uh, and in General Mills we do charity work every year and community work uh, as part of a, I think, global art volunteer local uh, project. We're an American owned company, so we we'll maybe do uh, some cleaning of a beach, some painting of some graffiti in the middle of the town in Berwick, Ireland. Cold stream anywhere. Uh, we'll be maybe clean some walkways. This year, uh, 2012, we decided that we we're going to be cutting the grass. <laughs> have the report, so it's just to see what, we're, what we've got. We, we had about 20 volunteers all together, and we embarked on clearing what was the, the King's Mount and the, the ditch at the side of it. Uh, and the enthusiasm of the group was, it was sort of infectious. Everybody got on board, everybody wanted to help, everybody's asking about it, and for my sins I get upset to every group. <laughs> uh, after the grass cutting, we moved on to, this is what the King's Mount looked at after the first stir, and you see it better on the aerial photograph. We then moved on with the skate team to do some consultation work and we decided what we could do, how we could enhance it, how we can get people to know about it. Uh, so we had the, the first meeting and we had a, a full public consultation where all the ideas got put together and the Friends of the Port was born. That's what we, we started to do on that night. We then, in the spring of the year, we had the uh, the same guy that we've seen before, Mark, uh, we had Eddie down with his hexacopter and we had the school children doing some 3D catching and they were, they were taking photographs from the air with the hexacopter and we also did some photographs of the clans and made 3D virtual models of the clans in the classroom. So we involved the school children quite, quite a lot along the way. This is them doing the 3D catching in the, in the school. There's Eddie talking to some of the, the friends and to our local MSP. Some of you may know that we, we did a presentation about a month ago at Parliament and to, uh, to the MSP that invited us along to the car this a really good, really good night. This is some of our community people doing the uh, geophysics. These are all members of Friends of the Port. Uh, we had other, other people there as well that uh, escape organised. There's Fiona using a funny thing, I don't level a Fiona like whatever it is. Uh, take it, we were doing a linear survey 
we're going to learn our sermon from, if you remember the photograph earlier, the caravans straight out into the flat bit, so we could get an idea of what the depths were on the, the moats, and what height the walls were, and things like that. But it was all work that we, we undertook with the skate team. Some more photographs of the geophysics work. Eddie got involved as well. You had to come and hold the, the big stick in a yellow one. <laughs> it was uh, quite a hard day. So now I'll, I'll hand you back to Fiona and she'll sort out the rest for you. We got very involved with the, with the schools, especially the primary school initially, and we had a competition for them to, to do what they, a painting of what they thought it would be like. And then we had the winners which was a great success, and that's them all family, and they all got a prize. Mm -hmm. And this is again the high school. We had a weekend when skate came down, the whole weekend was involved, and we, we, we did to, from the Friday night right through to the Monday, and this is the Monday morning, and this is the high school children. They're involved in this one. <coughs> and there's, um, there, there was a fair bit of chatting and working out of what wasn't going to, whose turn it was next to hold the big long pole. <laughs> and the little girl holding it there is only about two foot high. <laughs> and then we had a public meeting and we had on the Friday night and we had Dr. Um, David Caldwell and Dr. Bess Rhodes and she's a historian at, at university. David was the first, was, was the person, who, the archaeologist who'd done the dig initially and they gave an absolutely fantastic chat and the main thing is that they gave us the actual history of why the fort is how it is now and we even had lists of how many slates, how many nails, where the food came from, what food was sent down, lots and lots of really exciting stuff. And we also found, well David found, a tassel from the Frenchman's um, uniform, which, we, which is, we're now trying to get back to Imo. But it's incredible, a little funny, little funny tassel. We obviously like going to war very well dressed up. <laughs> and this is... The, the computer team, they were actually down with the primary school working through and I believe it might have been at this that the children took the avatar's clothes off and which caused great embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a grand opening. Um, Scotch Borders Council gave us a grant to build this room in the museum in Eyemouth. Um, the museum was going to a bit of a tough time and we needed something new sustainability and to make it much more attractive. Also the fact that the fort the way it is means it's very difficult unless you're like the rest of us a bit obsessed to see what it's like but with the 3D interactive and in the, actually in the museum it means that people can go between the two and see what it's like. And this is, this is, this is what you'll see at Alan and John's stand. And so we decided we would have a reenactment. So we had the border reavers, and they came in traditional and authentic 16th century clothes. It was absolutely fantastic. And they shot off these two uh, muskets, and two and a quarter million seagulls raised to the sky. <laughs> and was, everyone was diving under tables and hiding in corners as this all came down. <laughs> we all dressed up, we had, and there was 200 people that day came into the museum. And actually, since we've had the, um, the, the room in the museum, the footfalls improved by 44%. And this is traditional kitchen area from that time. And this is our supporters who continue to support us and are just make life very much more easy for us. Um, because we're a very small group, and as we said earlier by Ellie, not everyone knows about Iron Mouth, sometimes it's a bit difficult to keep everybody as excited as we are. We then, as, as Willie said, our um, MSP Paul Wheelhouse invited us to give a presentation um, to the MSPs at Holyrood with invited guests, and we had the great and the good of the country all came, and it was a fantastic night, um, and that's the jolly bunch of us. <laughs> and next in line, well, we've, we've given various talks last week it was um, at Creef and this week here which is fantastic and now what we've got to do is to ensure that we have proper signage because it's all very well having the 3D bit and people enjoying that you go up to the fort and you can't see it properly 
So that's our role. We have to have it cut, the grass cut properly, and to have proper signage and information. Because we are on the coastal path, which means it's just silly that people walk past and think, what are those bumps? They should be jumping up and down saying, yippee, it's Iron Mouth Fort. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>